This is Lagos, Nigeria's former capital city and today the country's economic and commercial nerve center. Although she had the smallest geographical size in the country, Lagos has always attracted a huge population influx daily from within and outside Nigeria by people in search of success and economic prosperity. She is the most popular state in Nigeria and this has continually exerted huge pressure on public infrastructure such as roads and drainages, public transportation and traffic control, social services, security and environmental management within the context of severely limited resources. The ugly strains of crime, congestion, traffic gridlock, armed robbery, mountains of rubbish, environmental filth, bad roads, collapsed health and educational facilities, societal breakdown and decadence increasingly worsened with time even as the population continued to grow exponentially. Lagos needed a thinker, a visionary and a modernizer at the helm of affairs. Bola Ahmed Tinubu came along. From a poor background, he struggled to read, traveled to the United States in search of the Golden Fleece. As proof of his brilliance from early in life, he made the honors list of Richard Daly College. He subsequently transferred to the Chicago State University, Illinois, graduating with honors in 1979 and earning a bachelor's degree in business administration, accounting, and management. Ashwaju is a friend of my youth a brother and a jolly good fellow. Bola and I were fortunate to have attended the same Chicago State University, CSU. But I was a year ahead of him. Bola studied accounting and no worry to state is how much of an exceptional accounting student he was so much so that he was a tutor and an academic mentor to his classmates and other students. Bola is a genius. It was not surprising that eventually graduated with honors and distinction with the prestigious that was inevitable. Upon graduation with honors and several awards, Bola Tinubu cut his professional teeth at the American-based Arthur Anderson Deloitte Haskins and Sales, now called Deloitte Haskins and Touche and GTE Service Corporation, the largest communication and utility company in the United States of America. Meanwhile, at Deloitte Haskins and Sales, the young and professional Bola broadened his experience by participating in the auditing and management consultancy services of General Motors, First National Bank of Chicago, Procter & Gamble, International Harvester, GEC, and other Fortune 500 firms. On his return to Nigeria with his international experience in finance management, young Bola joined Mobile Producing Nigeria as a senior auditor before he retired as the company's treasurer. Bola Chinumbu um, came to us late 1983 in Mobulo in Nigeria PSC to attend an interview for the position of an auditor in our audit department. He did the interview, he did it certainly well, and we had no choice than to offer him the job. He came in and uh, his performances were great, were excellent. So he's one individual, very proactive and very hardworking. He thinks ahead of his time. We appreciated him, we love him. And then we told him in 1992, when he came to us, that he wanted to go into politics. We were surprised. He said, what are you going to do in politics? You are doing very well here. And in fact, you have been tipped as one of the people to be considered for the post of the finance director when he, you know, when he Retires. He said, no, sir. He was adamant and said they had to go. Then we then said to him, for the excellent job you have done here, if you had to go and you lose, please come back to your job. He left. The remaining is history, which we all know today. Ashiwaju Bola Tinubu opted fully for public service in exchange for his lucrative job at Mobile. 
His first foray into active politics was as a founding member of the defunct Social Democratic Party SDP, on the platform of which he was elected in 1992 as a distinguished senator of the Federal Republic of Nigeria to represent Lagos West Senatorial District. He recorded the highest votes in the country in the Third Republic. He was chairman of the Senate Committee on Banking, Finance, Currency and Appropriation in that dispensation. He was at the forefront of the late Chief MKO Abiola's campaign for presidency in 1993 on the platform of the defunct Social Democratic Party SDP. When the June 12, 1993 election described as the freest and fairest in the country's history was annulled, Tinubu emerged as one of the fiercest opponents of the annulment. As the arrowhead of the struggle to actualize Abiola's mandate, the military junta reached out to him several times to jump ship and come over to their side. He refused to betray his principled commitment to the sanctity of a free and fair election. Exasperated by Tinubu's intransigence, the military viciously went after him along with other opponents of the annulment. He was charged with treason, detained, his house was firebombed. He eventually had to flee the country for his dear life. His wife, now Senator Oluremi Tinubu, and her children had to be smuggled out into exile. While in exile, he remained steadfast in his commitment to the pro-democracy struggle, making great personal and financial sacrifices towards this effort. Bola Ahmed Tinubu has remained true and loyal to MKO Abiola even till date, ensuring that his memory never fades. Hafsat Abiola, one of MKO's daughters, in a statement, acknowledged Bola Tinubu as the only one who still remembers MKO's family members and supports them. I call all of you here today to help me in expressing the immense gratitude that I have for Governor Ahmed Bola Tinubu. I'm from, I'm from Yoruba land, and the Yoruba people, in expressing gratitude, kneel down to greet those that for whom they are grateful. So in that tradition, I'm going to kneel down to greet Governor Asimbo. Help me, because as we know, not everybody remembers Moshud Hashimawu or Laole Abiola, not everybody remembers Kudirat Abiola. But Asimbo does not forget them, does not forget the price they pay. Me, in thanking him, Edjo, Edjo, Ebanki, thank you very much. In the year 1998, Ashuaju Bola Tinubu returned to Nigeria to heed a call for all Nigerians to join in the process of national reconciliation and development. A year later, he began his two-term public service as an elected governor of Lagos State on the platform of the Alliance for Democracy, AD. Under Tinubu's eight years as governor, Lagos came alive. Lagos had finally found a person with a vision and mission heading the government, a person who came prepared for the office. How can we so easily forget that one person who believed in the potentials and capabilities of this country? One patriotic Nigerian was the architect, the source of all the credible achievements that abound across the length and breadth of the Lagos of today. As elected governor, Tinubu took Lagos from jungle to megacity. He came prepared to serve. He came with a plan and blueprint to succeed. Tinubu inspired a 25-year development plan of Lagos and helped lay the foundation for the infrastructural renewal, revenue breakthrough, and related reforms in Lagos. When Ashiwaju Bola Ahmed Tinubu became governor of Lagos State, one of his first priorities was security due to the high rate of crime in the state at the time. To achieve this, he renamed the then Operation Sweep, which was a joint patrol team that had the Army, Navy, Air Force and the police and called it the Rapid Response Squad, RRS. He repositioned the team through training and provision of modern security equipments and communication gadgets. This boosted the morale of officers and the men of RRS, which translated to effective crime fighting in Lagos State. No elected governor in this dispensation since 1999 in Nigeria equals the vision, vigor and vitality Bola Tinubu brought to governance. He has built and improved on the worthy achievements of some of his predecessors, including Colonel Mobolaji Johnson, 
Alhaji Latif Jakonde, and General Mohammed Buba Marwa, amongst others. Today, Lagos is a national and global model of good governance, thanks to Tinubu and his party. So, how did it all happen? And who made it happen? A brief journey back into the physical, economic, and social conditions of Lagos some 23 years ago will reveal the following. When we came in as a democratic government in 1999, May was precarious, was coming into a jungle and in an uncivilized environment. One, there were rivers, mountains of rivers all over Lagos. Schools without roofs, no single ambulance to save life. You can Imagine where you don't even have hospital with one single uh, defibrillator or oxygen uh, facility that can save life. Civil service environment was of neglect and chaotic, total chaos and uh, disorganization. Tinumbu rewrote the rule book, broke away from development stereotypes and against all odds, in spite of detractors and political enemies, he initiated and implemented policies that laid the foundation for infrastructural renewal of Lagos. Sunday, 27th January 2002, Lagos experienced the worst disaster in its history when massive explosions rocked Lagos as the ammunition depot at the Keja Cantonment went up in flames. There was widespread panic, which led to the loss of many lives. The explosions continued for over two hours, and the talks of military attack on Lagos was rife. The television broadcast doused tensions and kick-started the massive rescue operations that ensued. This is Lagos State, and the nation have tried as much as possible to keep are uh, all aware. The presidency is aware of the situation. Our president is safe and sound. All democratically elected government is in place. There is no need to panic and there is no need to worry. If there is a need for any other action, you will hear from me as soon as possible. The Lagos we see today had one chief architect, Governor Tinubu, supported by a cast of competent technocrats and progressively-minded individuals, one of whom occupied a Laosa government house between 2007 and 2015, Governor Babatunde Fashola. Irreversible commitment to democratic value and rule of law is important to me. I will continue to be my abiding principle. Over 200 professionals of international standing formed 31 transition committees and recommended short, medium and long-term measures to make Lagos great again. Their recommendations were woven into a 10-point agenda whose implementation was phased across 25 years. For instance, legendary child health advocate and former Minister of Health, Professor Olikoi Ransomkuti, chaired the Committee on Health. It recommended the rehabilitation of the Island Maternity Hospital and other general hospitals as immediate measures. This was followed by the establishment of primary health care centers in each ward in the medium term as part of an efficient primary health care system that will attend to 70% of patients to enable general hospitals handle secondary health care. Other elements of the 10-point agenda include roads, comprising aggressive road rehabilitation in the short term and construction of new roads in the medium term. Transportation, traffic management in the short term and integrating the mass transit program with roads, rail and water transport services, Lamata, Lagbos, etc. in the medium term. Power and water supply, Introduction of independent power projects beginning with Enron IPP for industries in the short term and IPPs on the island, Alausa, Akute, Odomola and Adian Waterworks. Environment and physical planning, beautification and waste clearing in the short term, followed by community-based and integrated solid and liquid waste management in the medium term. Education, curriculum review, 
ownership review in the short term, infrastructural renewal and scholarships in the medium term. Revenue enhancement, short term, diversification of revenue sources, widening the tax net and effective revenue collection mechanism and database development in the medium term. Employment, graduate employment and job creation in the short term and skill acquisition in the medium term. Food security, empowerment of farmers, support for strategic food preservation and farm settlements. Shelter, provision of affordable mass housing and new town developments. A leader without character, without the vision to develop other talents, even if you have the great achievement in brick and mortar, and mortar, building bridges and all that. If you don't bring, build other successes, if you don't surrender yourself and build a team of visionary mind, uh, uh, people, you will lose your legacy. On his assumption of office as governor of Lagos State in 1999, Ashiwaju Tinubu inherited a state that was practically bankrupt. The total budget size of Lagos State at the inception of his administration was a little over 14 billion naira, while the state's internally generated revenue was approximately 600 million naira monthly. Yet, the public sector wage bill was 800 million naira. The implication was that Lagos State was entirely dependent on allocations from the center which was grossly insufficient to meet the huge challenge of rebuilding a state that had been neglected and allowed to decay for over two decades. Tinubu's re-engineering of the finances of the internally generated revenue of Lagos remains a sterling contribution. No matter how brilliant you are, no matter how brilliant you have an idea, it dies on the shelf of thinking if you cannot back it with revenue. And so, Ashiwaju sought the services of the best professional tax consultants. Through deft financial engineering, Tinubu turned around the finances of the state and by the time he left office in 2007, the IGR of Lagos was over 7 billion naira monthly. Governor Fashola built on this strong foundation and the IGR of Lagos became over 15 billion naira monthly. Through meticulous planning and disciplined implementation, the Ashiwaju Tinubu administration grew the budget size of Lagos State from 14.2 billion naira in 1999 to 240.866 billion naira in 2007. It is significant that at no time during Tinubu's stewardship did budget implementation performance fall below 60%. In a similar vein, the Tinubu administration consistently maintained an annual budgetary ratio of at least 60 to 40% in favor of capital over recurrent expenditure to ensure rapid infrastructural development. Initially conceived by the Ashiwaju Bola Ahmed Tinubu's administration as a solution to environmental hazards arising from the flooding of the Lagos Barbage, the Eco Atlantic project has snowballed to play host to a prime real estate location in Africa. Over the years, the Barbage had developed a reputation for overflowing its bank and claiming lives and property. Many times, the Amadubelo Way was closed for safety reasons. Studies showed that between 8 and 14 meters of the beachfront were eroded annually along the Bar Beach. In 2003, the idea of a modern city on the Atlantic coast was publicly discussed to be sited on what used to be the Bar Beach out of the reclaimed land. It will be called a co-Atlantic city, a residential and business district standing on 10 million square meters of land reclaimed from the ocean and protected by an 8.5 kilometer long sea wall. Today, the project has come alive with high net worth individuals and companies and even the US government is building an edifice on the site. In barely eight years under Ashiwaji's astute guidance, Lagos became financially viable and autonomous of the federal government. Lagos was attracting new investments in diverse sectors on a daily basis, despite the depressing national economic climate. 
upgrading of the buildings and facilities in the Lagos State University Teaching Hospital, Lasuf, to world-class grade, expansion and rehabilitation of all general hospitals in Lagos, Bagada, Ekbe, Ikorodu, Badagri, Agege, and the Island Maternity. I've converted the liability confronting Lagos to asset of great value. Along Osumban, by the way, we used to pick dead bodies. People had forgotten truck pushers in those areas. You have dirtiest coastal line along, you know, Osumba, by the way, all through Lake Ecole. I brought private investors. Hospitality. Now, they created the boat club civic center that is of great value to, to, to many people today. That was a refuse dump. Nobody easily will remember that. Oriental Hotel was a refuse dump. Miles, you know, of refuse along that corridor. It took several months of excavation and great investment for those investors to take the risk. The majority of those assets, they claim are mine, are not mine. I create economic path, a recovery path for Lagos. There's no state that can brag, brag of the exponential development that is going on in Lake Corridor today. Construction of 6,000 housing units such as the Abraham Adesoya Estate, Aja, Ibeshe Low Income Housing Scheme, Oba Adeyinka Oyekon Estate, Leki, Ayongbo Renfis II, Ikorudu, as well as the Oke Eletu and Okoaba Low Income Housing Schemes, among others. The modernizing idea of BRT system initiated by the visionary Ashiwaju Bola Ahmed Tinubu's administration was sustained by the Akiwumi Ambode administration, which initiated the construction of a massive, ultra-modern, multi-layered park for buses in Oshudi. It is consistent with a master plan conceived by Ashiwaju Bola Ahmed Tinubu to make public transport system in Lagos not only more pleasurable, but also at par with the experience in advanced countries. The idea of a light rail project for Lagos State was originally conceived by the first civilian governor, Alhaji Latif Jakonde, in 1983. It was to be called the Metro Line. However, the project could not be consummated before the civilian administration was terminated by the military coup of 1983. When he took over as governor of Lagos State, Ashwaju revived and expanded the idea to not one, but seven light rail projects in Lagos State to reduce the over-dependence on road transportation and to reduce traffic congestion in the state. The 27-kilometer Lagos Blue Line Rail Mass Transit will run from Lagos Marina to Urilegomu, to Mile 2, to Okokomaiko, and ultimately down to Badagri and will commence commercial shuttles in January 2023. The red line, which was started from scratch by the Babajide Sonwolu administration, will run from Agbado to Lagos Marina and will come on stream later in the first quarter of 2023. The Lekki Corridor has become the toast of real estate investors and the preferred location of mega industrialists. Lekki today boasts of the Dangote refinery and fertilizer plant worth over 19 billion US dollars, the Lekki Free Trade Zone, Lekki Deep Sea Port, amongst others. One man envisioned all this about 20 years ago. The man is Ashiwaju Bola Ahmed Tinubu. In 2006, he conceived an idea to develop some parts of Lekki Peninsula into a blue green eco friendly environment. This was to become the new industrial hub of Lagos. To make it attractive to local and international investors, it was to have the status of a free trade zone. His successor, Babatunde Fashala, continued the project and Governor Kimumi Ambode gave the project attention. The present governor of the state, Babajide Sawolu, is following the footsteps of his predecessors and today, 
The Lagos Free Trade Zone is not only contributing to the economy of Lagos State, but also Nigeria's GDP in general. But the story of Dangote Fertilizer and Refinery will be incomplete if we don't put the history to proper perspective. The idea around having a free zone in the Bejuleki area was conceived by our leader, Shuaji Bola Ahmed Tinubu. And I was with him in 2003, 2004, when we took a trip to China and we're trying to conceive a free zone. And today here, this free zone is not only home to the largest fertilizer in Africa, but will certainly be home to the largest refinery, a single refinery in the entire world, you know, come later in this year. Initiation despite stiff opposition by the federal government of the first successful independent power plant, IPP, by any state government, generating 260 megawatts of electricity from Ikorodu to the national grid. Completion of such abandoned projects like Teslim Balogun Stadium and the new government house at Alausa, as well as finding permanent solution to the erosion and perennial flooding of the Bar Beach by constructing an enduring shoreline defensive barrier. You must give credit to my predecessor. He was the one who started the protection of the Bar Beach. What the federal government used to do was to come and pump sand, 4 billion naira every year, and the sea will wash it away. And you can imagine how many four billions they have spent years and years until we said, no, there's a better solution to this thing. Before we did that thing, every year that it rained, flood used to reach NTA. NTA used to flood. NTA has not flooded for the last seven years that I have been here because that solution is working. What I set out to achieve for myself, I'm achieving it. I'm achieving success. I'm, a, I'm an architect a builder and a developer bunch into one. The architecture of the vision in public sector governance, I know it very well. We do it in celebration of a man who has spent the last 30 years of his life in creative and catalytic public service. He has from his days as governor of Lagos State, provided clarity of thought and vision, pioneering vision in all aspects of governance. And I believe that our country has been gifted by this great transformative leader, Ashiwaju Bola Ahmed Tinubu. Ashiwaju is widely known as political strategist. Strategy is better are less wedded to a higher purpose than just itself. Here, Aswaju also sets himself apart. I have come to see him as a man who cares about people and who is a fountain of ideas for economic of the common man and woman. He is a true humanitarian and we appreciate his contributions to Nigeria's and African progress. The continuation of Tinubu's outstanding policies makes Lagos State an exceptional and the foremost government in Nigeria. I left it better than I met it. This is the man, Ashiwaju Bola Ahmed Tinubu, a leader among leaders the irresistible force behind the movement for change in Nigeria.